Martin Parr might be one of the most pivotal figures in contemporary photography. Through his lens, the quirks and idiosyncrasies of society come alive. His distinctive style has forever altered documentary and street photography. Good photography comes from when someone has a good connection to the subject and they've used photography to articulate that. Parr's work surpasses the usual scope of documentary photography by blending it with a vibrant and satirical sensibility. His knack for capturing the essence of British life in all its eccentricity and charm while maintaining a profound sense of aesthetic beauty has elevated the genre to unparalleled levels. How do I edit? I pick out the good ones and forget the bad ones. It's that simple. This video delves into the world of Martin Parr, exploring his iconic images, his journey in photography and why photographers are captivated by his ability to spotlight the humor and beauty in everyday life. Martin Parr's approach to photography is both distinctive and intuitive. Rather than merely documenting scenes, he delves deep into the layers of society, capturing moments that others might miss. His lens often gravitates towards the mundane, the everyday and the overlooked, transforming them into compelling narratives that speak volumes about the human condition. Central to Parr's work is his unwavering focus on British life, from seaside resorts to suburban gardens, from high society events to everyday meals. He paints a vivid picture of Britain in all its eccentricity, diversity and charm. His images often carry a satirical undertone, highlighting the quirks and idiosyncrasies of its subjects. Yet, beneath the humor and satire lies a profound understanding and appreciation of the complexities of British society. Through vibrant colors and meticulous composition, Parr's photographs invite viewers to see the world from a fresh perspective, challenging preconceptions and encouraging a deeper understanding of the world around us. Martin Parr's interest in photography started at home, where his grandfather, an enthusiastic amateur photographer, introduced him to the medium. At school, his teacher saw something special in Parr and helped him develop his approach to the craft. He once reflected on his school days saying, My status at school was very low. I didn't enjoy school. But photography, which was rapidly becoming a significant part of pop culture in the 1960s, captured his imagination. A pivotal moment in his early career was shooting at Harry Ramsden in 1967 when he was just 15 years old. This fish and chips joint was more than just a restaurant. It was a symbol of changing Britain, where eating out was becoming part of everyday life. Here, Parr learned about people's vulnerability in restaurants and became fascinated with the role of food in British culture. Martin Parr's pursuit of photography led him to Manchester Polytechnic. The gritty and industrial atmosphere of Manchester appeals to him as a refreshing contrast to the fashion-driven culture of London. Here he found an environment that aligned with his own photographic and emotional inclinations. Enrolling in Manchester Polytechnic in October 1970, Parr found himself part of an especially dynamic cohort of promising young artists, including Daniel Meadows and Brian Griffin. Together, they formed an informal salon exchanging ideas and engaging in friendly competitions. Inspired by Tony Rain Jones and various American photographers, Parr honed his craft embracing a style that would become synonymous with his name. His years at Manchester Polytechnic marked the beginning of a career characterized by wit, insight and fearless approach to the art of photography. Even if you are familiar with Martin Parr, at least on some level, this project might still surprise you. Following his growth and exploration at Manchester Polytechnic, Martin Parr stumbled upon a setting that stuck a deep chord with him, Prestwich Mental Hospital. It was a place he had come to know from visiting a friend who had been admitted there. Parr recalls, I was so taken with the place that I decided to do some work and sort out permission to photograph there. Then got stuck in for the next three months, photographing constantly. Visually, it was very striking. The whole atmosphere, you just knew there was scope there. When you are a 19 year old photographer, you have aspirations, but it's difficult to know actually what to say. 
But suddenly, I found something I wanted to articulate. Pars project at Prestwich Mental Hospital became his first cohesive documentary endeavor. The striking visuals and unique atmosphere allowed him to find his voice and articulate his vision. But why might this project surprise those familiar with Parr's work? It is because later in his life Parr expressed reservations about photographing such places, saying the world is full of photographs of things like circuses, mental hospitals and carnivals, which people photograph because these subjects make good pictures. It is not that people care more about circuses or mental hospitals than other things, it is just they are classic subject matter for photography. Perhaps because of this perspective, his next project focused on something completely different. Parr's next journey led him to Butlin's holiday camp with his fellow photographer Daniel Meadows. Here the duo discovered a living capsule of traditional working class life. To the two photographers, Butlin's presented an extraordinary opportunity. They were paid to capture images of daily life at camp. But beyond the portraits they sold, they were free to create their own work. Parr's time at Butlin's intensified his fascination with certain visual combinations, kitsch imagery and the vibrancy of working class culture. We had to take more photographs than I have ever taken before in my life, he said in his biography. His experience at Butlin's helped him sharpen his focus on subjects that fascinated him, from nuances of class to kitsch in everyday life. It was at Butlin's that Parr began collecting postcards, a hobby that would inspire him later in his career. At Butlin's, Parr found more than just a job. He discovered a microcosm that allowed him to delve deeper into his craft. It was a stepping stone that shaped his unique perspective and solidified commitment to portraying the world with a critical yet empathetic lens. It was also during Parr's time at Butlin's that controversy around his work started to emerge. It marked the beginning of a debate that would follow him for years based on accusations that he was exploiting his subjects. Critics said that Parr exhibited a sense of class superiority towards those he photographed, that his work ridiculed them and made fun of their vulgarity and unease. This criticism grew louder when Parr started working in color in the mid-1980s. Some saw his work as mocking the poor, evidence of his own feelings of superiority. But I believe his intentions were never to belittle or mock his subjects. Rather, he aimed to capture the essence of British culture, unfiltered and genuine. Parr's fascination with the cultural uniqueness of the British, whether in their eating habits or social interactions, was not meant to ridicule, but to document to show life as it is. His work can be seen as a nuances reflection on British identity rather than a judgment or condemnation. In the early 1970s, Parr found himself at a significant crossroads in his young career. It was a time of both exploration and innovation, marked by an unmistakable intrigue with conceptual art. His 1972 project Love Cubes was a playful insight into relationships through photographs transformed into a board game. This inventive creation signaled Parr's desire to blend visual art with interactive experiences. The innovation continued with Home Sweet Home in 1974. This installation brought together Parr's various interests, kitsch aesthetic, collecting and domestic interiors all culminating in an immersive environment. Adorned with cake decorations and unconventional frames, it was both a statement and a challenge to British photography's traditional norms. Following Parr's ventures into experimental projects such as these, his attention shifted to something seemingly more conventional but equally profound. Parr settled down in Hebden Bridge, and for four years he and his collaborator Susie Mitchell, who later became his wife, engaged with the rural elderly. Parr's relationship with Grimsworth Dean Chapel became the most vital point in his career. The images he captured, both elegetic and unsentimental, portray a lost Eden and mark a consolidation of his emerging talents. However, the relationship eventually faltered when the spiritual distinction between Parr and the congregation became apparent. The time Parr spent in Hebden Bridge was a critical period of professional development and gave rise to a profound personal revelation that altered his perception of his relationship with his subject. 
His understanding of connection and intimacy with the people he photographed would be forever changed after this experience. You realize that however close and intimately you feel that you can work with people, ultimately you are never part of the thing. You are always entirely separate and your different background, your different cultures separate you out. However close you try to get, there is always that distance. This awareness marks a turning point in Parr's career, bringing forth a new level of maturity and understanding that would guide his future work. It speaks to a universal truth about photographers' relationship with their subjects, a delicate balance of connection and separation, intimacy and distance. Parr's realization underscores the complexity of human connection and the role of the photographer in capturing the essence of his or her subjects while remaining apart from them. As this project concluded, Susie Mitchell decided to enroll in the Irish Health Authority's program to train British graduates as speech therapists. Parr followed her and found himself in Ireland for two years. There he started the series Bad Weather, which was a departure from his previous work. Using a flash and underwater camera, Parr captured images of snow, rain and desolated city scenes. These photographs were both comic and lonely, subverting traditional ideas of documentary photography. Bad weather marked a reassertion of Parr's independence and illustrated photography as a solitary pursuit for him. This work was a sign of his artistic evolution and a harbinger of the radical transformation he would undergo upon returning to England in 1982. Finding England under the influence of Thatcherism, Parr's photography shifted dramatically. His work became vibrant, reflecting a nation in transition. After moving back to England in 1982, Parr settled in Wolsey. Just a few miles away, the seaside town of New Brighton summoned him with its energy and state of decay. It was this town that would become a major focus of Parr's groundbreaking series The Last Resort. This project signaled a profound shift in Parr's work, inspired by the color documentary of American photographers like William Egglestone and Joel Stanfeld, he bought a medium format German camera, the Plabel, and adopted a new vision and perspective. Parr's exploration of New Brighton celebrated the everyday, capturing the lively and comical aspects of the seaside town while also reflecting its decline. The Last Resort took a sharp, unflinching look at British holiday culture, filled with families, sunbathers, beauty competitions and occasionally litter or peeling paint. Parr's use of color and flesh gave the images a brush and close intimacy, creating a signature style that would become his trademark for a time. But as you might guess, The Last Resort also stirred controversy when shown in London. Critics once again railed against Parr's portrayal of ordinary people, accusing him of cynicism and mockery. Yet, as Parr himself pointed out, his images were never meant to be controversial. They were an exercise in observing, filled with interest, excitement and humor, far from a condemnation of Thatcherism or a grim portrayal of England. The last resort was a lively, touching and vigorous view of life as it was. When Martin Parr and Susie Parr moved from Wolsey to Bristol in 1987, it was a dramatic shift for Parr, because his primary subject matter had long been Northern England. Bristol presented a new complexity, with a history steeped in both immense wealth and profound poverty. Parr turned his lens on subjects he considered politically and culturally significant, and it was there he began the series that would be published as Cost of Living. These were turbulent times in Britain. Class boundaries were blurred, societal benefits were eroded and discontentment was growing. It was a period marked by the Brixton riots and royal weddings, by privatization and international conflicts. The cost of living showed what was happening in Britain during the Thatcher years. Money was becoming more important than class and people were worried about their rights. Parr captured these societal changes in his photos. The photos are about everyday things, like buying a new dress or keeping fit, but they also show how people worry and try to fit in. These images told stories about what was really happening at Parr's country at that time. 
The 1980s marked significant milestones for Martin Parr, including publishing two important series and exhibiting throughout Europe. But a more profound opportunity emerged in 1988. Neil Burgess, who had supported Parr's work and was now with Magnum Photos, facilitated Parr's move to the prestigious cooperative. Magnum represented legendary photographers and joining them would provide Parr with unparalleled access to an influential network financial security and professional recognition. Parr applied to join Magnum in 1988 and this move opened doors to corporate clients, advertising agencies and international projects. It extended his reach into new territories. The documentarist, best known for his extensive projects and exhibitions, was now playing in the big league commercially. His work founded a new avenue, reaching audiences on a greater scale. The early 90s marked an exciting time for Parr, with fruitful collaborations and widespread exposure. His works were featured prominently in public spaces and prominent publications, enhancing his profile and influence. Thanks to his extensive travels, he was able to expand his vision worldwide and focus on global tourism. His biting and satirical exploration of this theme and the all-too-common search for authentic cultures resulted in small world. Highlighting images of tourists with famous landmarks, this series reveals Parr's humorous and observant eye. Parr captures tourists in travel destinations around the globe, often engaged in taking photos themselves. The images in Small World delve into the sometimes absurd and comical aspects of tourism, reflecting the homogenization of global culture and the unending quest for the idealized tourist experience. Crowded tourist attractions kitschy souvenirs and the contrast between tourists' expectations and the reality of the places they visit resonate throughout the series. The 90s were a period of significant transformation with Parr embarking on a series he considered one of its most crucial, common sense. The cover image depicting a section of a rusty globe transformed into a money box captured his growing concerns with globalism and the encroachment of corporate culture. Common Sense is a visual dictionary of the decade, blending high visual glee with a profound sense of unease. The images within were vivid and unapologetic. Beyond the feast of fast food, Parr's imagery delved into symbols of consumerism's darker side. Blotcher red meat, cigarette ants, ruined food and the omnipresence of brands like Coca-Cola, Nike, Sony and Disney. Through unsettling juxtapositions and contrasts, Parr portrayed a world both entrancing and repellent, where both symbols of royalty suffered from wear and decay. Common Sense also captured tender moments of reverence for the small and traditional. But the overall feeling derived from the work was that the world is slowly slipping away, overshadowed by the triumph of corporatism over community. In many ways, Common Sense liberated Parr, serving as a summation of three decades of photography that continued his legacy as a politically acute, populist and inherently romantic artist. His ability to mock what demeans us while honoring the gentle and the traditional set him apart. The series stands as one of Parr's most perceptive and perhaps underestimated pieces of work, a mixture of the sugary, decaying and fascinating remnants of a society in transition. As the new millennium began, the world of photography had significantly changed from the time Martin Parr first started capturing life in 1970s. Financial grants and magazine commissions, once common, had decreased. Even Magnum, where Parr had been a member since 1994, faced cutbacks in both scope and staff. In 2001, Parr himself speculated that his finest work might be behind him, perhaps influenced by the lukewarm reception to his book Think of England. However, this viewpoint seemed to shift in 2002 with his extensive retrospective at London's Barbican Art Gallery. The exhibit elevated him from a peripheral figure to a central force in British photography. This comprehensive showcase covered the full range of his artistry, from his early black and white works to his color series of the 80s. Surprisingly, his lesser known early work gained critical acclaim, dispelling his initial concerns about its inclusion. 
The photography landscape had changed, but so had Martin Parr. While the world grew obsessed with sensation and fast food, Parr's lens remained steady, capturing humanity in all its forms. The retrospective was not merely a career summary, but a validation of its enduring relevance in a continually changing photography world. Moving on to 2004, Parr ventured into curating. This shift marked a significant evolution in Parr's career, but his enthusiasm for photography remained unwavering. If I had to pick my favorite series, it would probably be Auto Portrait. This collection, featuring images of Parr himself captured in small studios worldwide, signaled a change in his focus. Moving away from the societal critique in his early works, he returned to a more reflective, conceptual style reminiscent of his Home Sweet Home series. In 2017, Martin Parr took step in cementing his legacy by opening Martin Parr Foundation in Bristol. More than just a gallery to display in his own work, the foundation serves as an institution dedicated to collecting, celebrating and promoting photography from the British Isles. Parr's influence isn't confined to just his work behind the lens. As a devoted collector and curator, he amplifies his impact as a creator. Over the years, Pars has amassed a collection of intriguing items, from rare photographic books to everyday ephemera, such as postcards and souvenirs. The scope of his collection is so expansive that it rivals even national archives. Whether it's press photo of celebrities altered by editor's marking, or timepieces featuring fallen dictators, Parr's collected items hold a mirror to societal shifts and events. The power of these collections lies in their ability to symbolize the transient nature of fame, power and even historical relevance. Martin Parr is still active to this day and he's having exhibitions around the world like this one in Malaga. Martin Parr's enduring legacy in the realm of photography is deeply enriched by his multidimensional roles as a creator and curator. While he began his journey focusing on the British seaside, often seen as the epitome of societal decline and shifting tastes, he has broadened his scope over the decades to include an international perspective. His seminal work, The Last Resort, unveiling the gritty reality of once vibrant new Brighton, mirroring how socio-economic tides can ebb and flow. As we moved on to explore various layers of society, his lens continued to strip away the facade of affluence and aspiration, making us question the real worth of wealth and social standing. Another photographer who dedicated her life to documentary photography was Mary Ellen Marr. Even though her work is totally different from Martin Parr's, if you enjoyed this video, you will love the story of Mary Ellen Marr as well. See you in the next video.